episode 237. Welcome to Data Skeptic, a podcast about data science and fake news from an algorithmic perspective. Here's your host, Kyle Polich. Coming to you from Los Angeles, California, this is Data Skeptic. I'm excited for today's show, you guys. This is like a heavy theory episode. In this episode, I'm interviewing Dorji Brody. His work is focused on building mathematical models of fake news. Under what circumstances might the presence of fake news actually change the outcome of what otherwise might have been? Let's get right into it. My name is Dorji Brody. I'm a professor in mathematics at the Department of Mathematics at University of Surrey in the UK. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got interested in this topic and what began the research in general? So one of the areas in which I work quite extensively is in sort of applications of communication theory. My personal motivation for this particular study comes from having have seen what has happened in the 2016, the so-called Brexit referendum in the UK concerning the membership of uh, European Union, where the public has been asked to cast votes on the basis of, in essence, pure disinformation. Uh, since at the time, no one knew what Brexit really meant. And this was and continues to be labelled as a democratic process. This was rather unpleasant to watch. As an applied mathematician and an information scientist, I felt that where I can or I might be able to contribute to the society is to provide an understanding of the phenomena we have seen. So the ultimate goal, I suppose, is to use the modeling framework to develop policies and strategies to counter the threats of large-scale disinformation in democratic processes. And this is meant to be the first step towards that goal. Makes sense. I think it's a very admirable goal. Regardless of one's politics, uh, we'd like to think that everyone makes an informed decision, not a misinformed decision, I guess. Exactly. So how do you go about beginning formalizing this problem mathematically? The structure, or if you like, the mechanism of the model is quite simple, in fact. Now, in mathematical modeling, it is not possible to create realistic models because real systems are too complicated, whereas tractable models are necessarily simple because otherwise you can't make predictions and so on. However, my own view is that this is sometimes a misconception. If one understands the mechanism of the phenomena, and in particular, the causal relations of events, that is to say, what has resulted in what, and so on, then by modeling the basis of the phenomena, as opposed to the outcome of the basis, one can actually come up with fairly realistic models that can often be treated without too much of an effort. And in the present context, to model dissemination of this information, it was clear to me that the tools required for this are those from communication theory. After all, the phenomena at hand is precisely a situation in which someone transmits false information. This information is received by the public. So we have a communication channel. And in the context of election or referendum in particular, the voters would like to know, for instance, which positions the candidate would take over a range of issues if he or she were to be elected in office. Or perhaps voters may wish to know about the personality or integrity of the candidate. These issues we have referred to in our paper as factors so the voters wish to find out candidates' positions on these factors. A priori, the voters do not know, however, uh, which values these factors might take. And when I say the values, suppose a given factor concerns candidates' position on abortion right, then we assign values to the position. So, for instance, zero would indicate that the candidate is against abortion and value one would be four abortion right and so on. So for each factor, we assign these values and the voters do not know a priori values of these factors. Now, as for the estimation of the factors, this is where we use techniques from communication theory, uh, or in particular, 
one technique known as filtering theory. And the idea is that the values of these factors play the role of the signal in a communication channel, but the signal is obscured by rumors and speculations. And as a consequence, they can only come up with the best estimate. Uh, in, in a situation where there is no disinformation, then that's all there is to it. So the question is, what happens if we have fake news in the background? This is where our model church comes in. And after thinking about it for some time, I came to the view that since fake news or disinformation by nature is not directly an indicator for the value of these factors, from the point of view of signal processing, it can't be viewed as representing the signal, and therefore it has to represent noise. However, it is a type of noise which is not normally treated in the context of signal processing. So now, if we went back to signal processing, normally the choice of noise has got no bias because people have speculation in one way. If some people have speculations and you know, rumors going in one way, there are equally many people having speculations and rumors going the other way, and so on. So normally, uh, in signal processing, noise is unbiased. And our view is that in the case of a deliberate uh, misinformation, we have a biased noise. However, the public who are at the receiving end of this signal in quotation or signal plus noise are not aware of the fact that the noise has got a bias. And therefore, without that knowledge, people will try to estimate as they would have without having any fake noise or the bias in the noise. That results in a skewed estimation of these factors. Got it. So that's a person that's I don't want to say they're too trusting. Maybe that's a a naive way to describe it. But if they're unaware of fake news, then as they get information, as they get signal, they would update their beliefs accordingly, and they might arrive at a belief that doesn't match the real world. Is that correct? Yes, that's the idea. But certainly some people are aware of fake news. Can you tell me about how we model the different pieces of the population? The way we structured the population, (laughs) so to speak, is to classify them into three different categories or types, if you like. Category one are those who are not aware of the existence of fake news. And category two are those who are not aware of whether any given information contains fake element or not, but nonetheless, they know with some probability there are fake news in circulation. Putting it more precisely in a mathematical term, they know the probability distribution of the fake news, but they don't know if any given information is real or not. So that's category two voter. And category three voter represents those who can identify precisely what fake uh, elements in the noise are, and therefore they can disregard them altogether. Now, category three is equivalent to having a situation where there is no fake news. So category three is more for comparison, and it's meant to be an idealized voter, which in reality can't be there. So Mm -hmm. in reality, the public can be split into category one or category two, we would argue. So category two has no classifier, is that correct? Or do they have a a weak classifier? I don't know that I can detect all fake news, but I think certain things I can detect. No, they don't have any classifier. They only know the probability distribution. Got it. So we have a statistical model of them. Yes, yes. So they don't actually have any classifier. They're just aware that with some probability, there are some fake elements I like the way the paper then sets this up as a time series problem, because, of course, new information arrives all the time, and sometimes predictably, sometimes unpredictably, and it's a mixed signal. Can you tell me a little bit about the dynamics of how you've modeled it? The way we model this is very much in line with standard filtering theory or signal processing, with the difference of having this biased component added to the noise. 
The factor that people are trying to figure out, that's identified as a signal component. And added to that is the noise component, which, as I said earlier, represents things like rumors, speculations, and so on. On top of that, we have an additional process added to the noise, except unlike the standard noise where it has no bias, the fake news element added to the noise has got the bias. So the expectation of that quantity is non-zero. And the sum of those processes, so as for the signal we took for simplicity that it's revealed to the voters linearly in time at some constant rate. That's merely for simplicity. Uh, we know how to handle the situation for a more complicated scenario, but we didn't examine that in our paper. And then we use a standard brown emotion to model noise. This is a very standard choice of noise. There's a good reason why brown emotion is a good choice especially in a situation like this where there are a large number of people involved and the law of large number tells you that things will be normally distributed. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we have fake news term, which depends on how one wants to model that. In the simplest case, you have a linear growth fake news term. In other examples, we have looked at primary in our paper is where the fake information is released and its strength grows linearly in time initially, but then each fake news is subsequently suppressed exponentially. I think my audience will be very comfortable with the linear model. I mean, we could question it maybe as an assumption, but as you said, there's other ways to model it if you want to. But at a, at a high level, the this idea that new signal comes to me more and more over time and I should become more and more informed, this seems very intuitive. I'm afraid my audience may not be familiar with Brownian motion. It doesn't come up so much in machine learning. Could you give maybe a high-level description of how that describes the evolution of your system? The signal part, uh, as you just said, grows linearly in time. And added to that is this process called Brownian motion. And Brownian motion starts at value zero, and it, then it continuously moves up and down randomly in such a way that any, at any time t, the distribution is normally distributed with mean zero and variance t. The magnitude of Brownian motion grows like square root of t. In the context of standard problem in signal processing, where there is no this fake news term, then the signal grows linearly in time, and the noise grows in magnitude like square root of t. And therefore, as time progresses, you learn more and more, and ultimately, your knowledge would will converge to the true value of the signal. That's how things work. The fact that brown emotion is used almost unanimously in many problems in signal processing, in engineering, etc., is because when you have a large number of elements contributing to noise, each one contribution could be going one way or another. But when a large number of these are superimposed, then the law of large number says this quantity has to be normally distributed. And that's why brown emotion is a good choice for noise in the present context. I, I especially appreciate your point that in a, in a universe where there is no fake news, maybe there could still be a lot of noise, but eventually uh, we will converge to the true value. This is just the natural dynamics of the system. In the presence of biased noise, uh, you, I know you part of the work was doing a lot of simulations. Can we get into yeah. some of the findings there? What happens to people under different circumstances of different volumes of fake news and so on and so forth? So let's look at the category one voters. Mm -hmm. So these are voters who are not aware of fake news. In their case, they will make, if you like, the correct in quotation estimate if there was no fake news. <laughs> okay, so they, they arrive at the correct estimate if there was no fake news. However, because what they observe, in fact, contains this additional term, the resulting estimate is going to be pushed in one direction or the other, the, uh, into the direction which is intended by whoever has released the fake news. So we've run quite a large number of simulations, one of which 
is to do with referendum type situation. Another is to do with a two candidate uh, election scenario. A sort of typical situation one might encounter from simulation, it's actually best to look at the figures in a paper. <laughs> but uh, if I uh, might draw attention to figure two of the paper, we have two candidates in an election situation. We have one year time period leading up to the polling day. We have compared two simulations, namely category one and category three. So by category three, I mean a situation where there was no fake news in effect. And there one finds typically that one of the candidate wins fairly comfortably, whereas if you start releasing the fake news repeatedly at some random time, then even though each fake news we have modeled to be suppressed exponentially in time, just by having these news released repeatedly is sufficient to change the outcome of the election. We have picked some parameter values for those particular values, for instance, we can say that in th the likelihood of fake news flipping the election outcome is about 30%. So one can study these things, such as parameter dependence of the likelihood of changing the election outcome, and so on. But the most striking result that we observed from the simulation is as follows. This is the comparison where we now throw in the category two voters. Remember, the category two voters are not aware whether any given piece of news is fake or not. They merely have the statistics of the fake news, that is, that is to say, the probability distribution of the fake news. For them to actually work out the best estimate of the signal, it turns out to involve rather sophisticated mathematics, unlike in the other case, where there is no fake news. If you work that out, uh, make a large number of simulations and take the average, the estimate of these Category 2 voters are almost the same as those of Category 3, i.e. where there was no fake news. So put it differently, Category 2 voters, by being very sophisticated, are able to mitigate the majority of the risks associated with fake news. Mm, and you were saying, though, that that requires them to have some sort of algorithmic or statistical process that's challenging. Uh, how exactly do Category 2 voters make use of their statistical knowledge of the distribution? The mathematics that models what happens is, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, technique of filtering theory. So basically, you have this signal plus noise plus possibly fake news. Mm -hmm. and if you have fake news, then you have three unknowns the signal, the noise, and the fake news. But you have one known, which is the sum of the three. Obviously, if you have three unknowns and only one known, you can't determine the unknowns. But given that data, given that time series, you can come up with the best estimate. You can actually do the calculation for the best estimate of the signal. And that calculation is a very sophisticated process but it's doable. And therefore, if one has that level of sophistication, one can filter out a great majority of the fake news elements without knowing whether any given piece of news is fake or not. In the digital economy, organizations are turning to their data and analytics leaders to lead with purpose, to create order from chaotic data across a multitude of sources, to achieve analytic clarity. Empowered by the digital imperative, now is the time for you to play a more strategic role. It's time to create a data-fluent organization. And that journey can start at the Gartner Data and Analytics Summit, Orlando, Florida, next March 18 through 21. Gartner will help you take data and analytics to the next level, to lead with purpose and achieve clarity in a world of ambiguity. Join more than 3,000 data and analytics leaders. Hot topics will include AI, machine learning, IoT, digital twins, data science, advanced data analytics, pervasive analytics, and data governance. Learn more by visiting gartnerevents.com slash data skeptic. And save the date, March 18 through 21, 2019 in Orlando, Florida. More information at gartner, G-A-R-T-N-E-R, events.com slash data skeptic. All one word, all lowercase. 
Gotcha. So this sounds like a, a nice promising result from a societal standpoint, that if we can just mo- migrate people from category to one to category two, then they have what they need to come rather close to category three. Is that a correct interpretation? Well, in the ideal world, yes. But in reality, this is probably not realistic or feasible. Given the degree of sophistication needed, probably what is needed is a policy maker who can do this for the public. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just the, the analysis seems to be very sophisticated. And if it's sophisticated for highly trained applied mathematician, then... <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So I think where this can be used is more in the direction of policy makers to implement the model and try to guide the public. The simulations in the paper, or at least the couple of examples pulled out, of course, depend on some parameters that are chosen. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, maybe a critic could come at this and say, oh, well, you've finely tuned the parameters to a result. How robust, I assume you ran, you know, lots of other iterations that uh, there just isn't room for in the paper. How robust are these Mm -hmm. results across a variety of different uh, initial configurations? Okay, so the first uh, remark I'd like to interject is that the code that we have used for the simulation is publicly available. We give a reference to that in the paper. So in principle, anyone can test the code. That's the first remark. In terms of parameter sensitivity, we haven't carried out extensive sensitivity analysis yet. The simulation is fairly costly for the Category 2 voters. Mm. But we have done some preliminary analysis of the kind. The estimate of Category 2 voters is quite robust against small misspecifications of the parameters. I should also clarify, however, one important point when I say they are aware of the probability distribution of the fake news. Well, there are several parameters involved. One to do with its strength or magnitude, and one to do with its decay rate, and one to do with its frequency. And finally, the one which gives you the direction of the fake news. Are you releasing fake news to support candidate A or candidate B? So those are the parameters we have. One parameter, which is very important for category two voter to know, is the direction. Whether the fake news is intended to support candidate A or candidate B. Mm -hmm. If you get that wrong, then they won't perform very well. Mm -hmm. So for all other parameters, the result is is reasonably robust. But it's based on the understanding that they know that the fake news out there are largely intended to support one of the candidates. You know, in a fairly real world example, I think we would assume that there are Fake news for both candidates, but you know, if they canceled each other out, it would just be standard Gaussian noise. So, uh, mm-hmm. is it uh, robust to say that the model just uh, assumes that we take the magnitude of the strongest fake news for whichever candidate is generating or ha- has the fake news out- generated on their behalf? That that's ultimately the magnitude we work with. Yes, you're you're right, and people have to know that once things are canceled out, what remains? Which candidate gets more? support from people who release fake news. Right. So that's what people have to know. And in many situations, my suspicion is that people can probably tell <laughs> which way that might be. Although another inter- related question that we haven't analyzed is what if the direction of fake news is also regarded as random variable? Mm, mm-hmm. Uh, in that case, how good or bad the estimate might be, uh, we just don't know. We haven't analyzed that yet. So we talked a little bit about tractability and how you developed the model in the early parts of our discussion. I very much agree with the, one of the points you were making that sometimes you know, any system you want to model, you have to get a physicist and model all the particles in it. And we know we'll never complete this. So all models are something that is simplified in some certain way. But then, of course, as the question becomes, how do we measure its predictive power or its uh, applicability? 
There are simple systems like Go that emerge massive complexity, but the rules are quite simple. So maybe a simple model can describe the process. What are your thoughts on the model you have and how much benefit you'd get from extra pass like that? Uh, the one you just described, or maybe I want to describe the fake news decaying instead of exponentially by some other function. It's all very doable, but uh, are there any advantages to adding in more complexity? I don't think there's much to gain in making things uh, a lot more complicated than what we have. My experience from applying sort of filtering techniques to phenomenology across a wide range of phenomena is that these models tend to be fairly realistic and it, it captures the essence of what one sees. So I'm fairly confident about that. Now, in terms of predictability, well, first of all, well, some of the parameters will have to be calibrated, and that requires some statistical analysis. Mm-hmm. Once that's done, there are things we can do. For instance, as I said earlier, for these parameter values, we can say what's the percentage of flipping the election outcome. Or given the uncertainties in the parameters, one can also estimate things like owing to fake news, the outcome can be shifted by between 5 and 10%. If that is what we know, then the policymaker can say, for instance, in a referendum situation, that given that there could be potentially up to 10% swing owing to fake news, perhaps the outcome would be accepted only if one side gains more than 60% vote rather than 50%, Ah, for instance. that's very interesting, yeah. So there, there, there are different ways in which one could potentially use the model. So that would be sort of you know, preventative measure, a little similar to climate science. You know, In climate science, we have many, many, many models. People simulate all of these in parallel, and that gives you a range of possible outcomes. And then you try to prevent the worst case uh, situations by implementing certain policy and so on and so forth. In, in a similar way, this model can be used for defending a democratic process. At the moment, the ones who benefit the most from our paper is the one who wishes to disseminate fake news. <laughs> <laughs> How so? Let's take a simple situation. Imagine that you only have one shot at releasing fake news between now and your November election or whenever, whatever, okay? The question is, okay, when should you release it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an optimization question. Without the model, you can't answer that question. But now we have presented a model, so you can actually figure that out. You want to have maximum impact. At which time should you release the fake news? At which frequency should you release the fake news? And so on and so forth. So these questions can be analyzed by those who wish to disseminate fake news. That is why I feel it's important that policymakers get on top of these models and try to support more research into this direction to counter <laughs> the potential misuse of the model. Maybe by a, a sort of a second order effect, if the um, nefarious person wants to use your model to optimize the time of release, I, as a researcher, could use the same thing to anticipate where they will target. And uh, I don't know what defenses I have available, but I could optimize my defenses to meet their attack, I suppose. Yes, things like yeah. that, exactly. So um, nothing against policymakers, but I don't know that they're always the strongest mathematicians. I do agree that they're central nodes. So if you can have an impact with a policymaker, this has you know um, stronger uh, net effects than influencing one voter or something like that. Do you have any practical recommendations? Should we happen to have a policymaker listening? How do they benefit from your work and work like yours to better keep the election system based on truthful information? As you will know quite well, there have been, over the last two years in particular, a lot of academic research into fake news. Mm -hmm. Uh, The majority of these are to do with detecting fake news and to do with retrospective analysis of what has impacted what, you know, going looking back in the past. These things are mostly done by computer scientists. This type of research is extremely important, but that alone is not too helpful because 
you know, the idea of, you know, a uh, fact checker, for instance, in an environment where there's so much fake information around, you know, it's like trying to extinguish forest fire with a glass of water. In parallel to that, one has to have a more detailed study of simulations and models for fake news for the purpose of, you know, scenario analysis and policy development. It's important to support both these research. That's something that the policymakers can push for, and hopefully by government working closely with academics doing research into fake news, one can develop a more robust policy or strategy to counter the threat of fake news. To wrap up, can you tell me a little bit about where your work is going and how people might follow you? Well, I, I mean, all my papers are publicly available. For me, at the moment, uh, my next step is to initiate more mathematical studies for strategy developments. Uh, I just mentioned that for someone who may wish to disseminate fake news, they can ask questions related to optimization. And that's what I would like to understand now, uh, because without the understanding of that, one can't start thinking about how to counter that. But of course, I also will need a resource for that, so uh, secure some funding to continue further research into this direction. Great. Well, I hope that comes through because I enjoyed the paper and I think further work in this direction is going to be important. To wind up, can you remind us a little bit? I know we talked about this earlier, but uh, let's leave the listeners with a note about the magnitudes. To the degree we find your models applicable, what have they taught us about the magnitude to which an election can be influenced because of the introduction of fake news? Well, of course, that depends on the parameters. And these parameters are chosen such that the resulting simulations at least qualitatively, look fairly similar to what we saw during the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Based on those parameter choices, the likelihood of election outcome being flipped due to fake news is about 30%, which is fairly significant. I mean, that's the likelihood of flipping, not not the magnitude of uh, flip, but the likelihood. So the magnitude, uh, they, they are fairly close. Sign- so, so it's not flipping by a significant margin. It's more like, you know, 51 versus 49. That's sort of number yeah. typically what we're looking at. But that's compared against a situation where if there was no fake news, then the other candidate would have won more easily, like, you know, 54 or 55%. So in terms of the uh, shift in percentage, maybe it's, you know, of order 5%. But the likelihood of that happening is about 30%. Well, Dorji, this has been really interesting. I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show and share your work. I hope uh, people check out the paper and that there's continued interest in the subject. Yeah, yeah, not at all. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic, where the news may be fake, but the data doesn't lie. Show your support by getting a t-shirt at dataskeptic.com.